Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Now, in today's episode, we are shining a spotlight on a topic of paramount importance, investigations within the municipal sector, particularly concerning harassment, sexual harassment, and discrimination. Now, in light of recent events and growing awareness surrounding workplace misconduct, municipalities across the nation are increasingly confronted with the imperative to address such issues head on. Harassment, bullying, sexual misconduct, and discrimination not only corrode workplace culture, but also undermine the very fabric of trust and integrity which municipal governance relies. So joining us for today's conversation is Bob Stenhouse, President and CEO of Veritas Solutions, a leading firm renowned for its expertise in conducting thorough and impartial investigations. With a team of industry-leading investigators equipped with specialized training and decades of experience, Veritas Solutions navigates the complexities of workplace dynamics with precision and also empathy. Their investigations process is meticulous, ensuring the principles of natural justice and procedural best practices are upheld from the outset. Through respectful and considerate interviews, coupled with the examination of cooperative evidence and credible assessments, Veritas Solutions delivers comprehensive reports that stand up to legal scrutiny. Moreover, Veritas Solutions goes beyond mere investigations, offering value-added human resource crisis troubleshooting and engaging training workplace amid and fostering a culture of respect and accountability within the municipal workplace. Now, in today's discussion, we delve into the scope and expected outcomes of municipal investigations, exploring the role of expert investigators like Bob in safeguarding the rights and well-being of municipal employees and constituents alike. So stay tuned as we navigate this crucial aspect of municipal governance, seeking to foster safer, more inclusive, and resilient communities. This is Municipal Affairs. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Bob, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking about this important discussion. Um, I want to start, if you don't mind, for those who may not know who you are, who are outside of Alberta or who have never had the pleasure to meet you, can you give me an elevator pitch on who Bob Stenhouse is and what Veritas Solutions does? Absolutely. Uh, Thank you for having me, Chris. So I've been involved in investigations of one sort or another, either conducting investigations myself or overseeing them or leading teams that do investigations for almost 40 years. And um, uh, Veritas, so so I'm starting with my policing career back in the RCMP, and then I was a human rights investigator for a while, then I was a workplace investigator, and uh, we specialized, Veritas Solutions was launched in 2018 and specializing in workplace regulatory sport investigations, as well as church and faith-based investigations. Um, I launched Veritas Solutions after I spent 10 years with Alberta Health Services, which was the largest employer in Alberta, largest health authority in Canada, and I was leading uh, complex investigations with them for, uh, for 10 years. So my background is in investigations is very deep. Um, when we launched in 2018 as a firm, we have about uh, 30 uh, investigators now uh, across Canada. And when we launched as a firm, it was right around the same time that both the um, uh, health and safety legislation changed to include harassment in the workplace. 
as well as the council code of conduct um, came into effect or the requirement for mayor and council to have code of conduct uh, came into effect back in 2018 or so. And so it was right at that particular time where we started to do a number of different types of investigations across industries, but municipalities, we did a lot of municipalities and still do a lot of municipality investigations from a employee perspective. So CAO down, but also we've done several CAO up. So we've done investigations into mayor and council code of conduct. So I want to start by asking sort of a, odd question to start off the interview, but I think it's the most important one to get the conversation rolling. You have, and for those who are listening, we're going to be sticking towards the more municipal realm because we are in the municipal world on this show. So I want to get from your perspective, what are some of the misconceptions around an investigation and why an investigation would happen, particularly in the municipal realm? And when you do go into the municipal world, whether it be CAO down or CAO up, how do you address those sort of misconceptions with uh, a potential, with someone who might be going, why are you investigating this? Right. Well, there, there's two things that that um, I think that I would pick up on what you just said. There's misconceptions and then there's risks. <laughs> and, uh, How'd you and, know that was the next question there, Bob? <laughs> so um, I think misconceptions are that a third party investigative firm um, has allegiances, alliances to whoever's paying the bill. <laughs> That's one of the misconceptions because we pride ourselves on our independence or impartiality and our courage to come to a finding that might not be popular. And we have to do that without fear or favor. And that's one of the misconceptions and, and myths that, that I, you know, spend some time, um, you know, kind of uh, challenging and and our, our work speaks for itself because we have done uh, investigations that have been in the news. And, um, and you can see where our findings uh, based on the evidence um, might not have been uh, welcomed by the client because it paints the client in a poor light. So that's one of the misconceptions, I think, about third-party investigations. The issue of bias is critical. Um, apprehension of bias, whether it be mayor and council choosing to do an investigation themselves uh, or going to a third party, even though a third party is going to be costly, um, you are mitigating your risk of that apprehension of bias. So that's one of the kind of the misconceptions. Areas of risk do come into play there, and that that uh, particular um, either accusation or apprehension of bias. Here's the thing. In an investigation, rarely, if ever, do we have someone that has engaged in misconduct say, yeah, you got me. I engaged in misconduct. I've been a bully. I've been a jerk. I've been sexually harassing so-and-so. I've been uh, overstepping my back. Rarely do we have that level of either self-awareness or self-disclosure to say, well, you know what? I've been a jerk. I'm going to change my ways. So we do an investigation. We come to a finding perhaps that someone has engaged in misconduct um, and they don't like the finding. And so needless to say, this is not a, this is not a vocation um, where we are driven by a popularity contest or that people are going to like what we come to. So prior to the interview, I was researching uh, Veritas Solutions and I was looking on your website and two words popped out at me and I didn't understand them. And I'm kind of, if I don't understand them, then I, I assume my, and I should ever assume because you know what that the, the saying goes, but I want to get your opinion on what do you, what does Veritas Solution mean by natural justice? Because you say on your website that the investigations that you do can be upheld within the natural justice system. And I want to ask that before I ask my next question that follows up on the statement that you said before. So what does natural justice mean? Okay, so it, it's a principle in law, basically the principles of natural justice. And what that means, there's two parts to it. One, <clears throat> pardon me, one is that a person that is alleged to have engaged in misconduct has the right to an unbiased investigation and process. That's the one aspect. The other aspect of the principles of natural justice and procedural fairness is that that person has the right to respond. They have the right to tell their side of the story. And so 
<clears throat> we guide all of our investigations within that principle and framework. And how we do that is A, ensure that we are not biased, that there's no um, reasonable apprehension of bias or allegations of conflicts of interest or those types of things that we are just impartial. We we don't have any, you know, to use the quote skin in the game. Um, we just come in and do right. So that's the bias part. The other part is to make sure that our process identifies very clearly to the respondent of the allegation what the allegations are and gives them the opportunity for, to full answer in defense. So we're giving them an opportunity to respond. Um, and what's happened over the years is that many, um, I shouldn't say many, but there's, there's investigations that have been conducted by maybe people that aren't qualified and they miss those steps. And so they think that they can just come in and do it, even though I have a personal relationship with somebody or I'm related to somebody, we'll just do the investigation, number one. Number two, we're not going to tell you what it's about. And we're just going to have a conversation. And so that's where I think organizations get themselves in hot water. So that's the explanation of the, the principles of natural justice. So how do you ensure that procedural fairness at the end of the day? Because if and, and I'm, I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate with you here for a second, Bob, and I hope you don't mind that. But if I'm getting accused of something, how do I know that you're going to be fair and impartial when you're conducting that investigation? So you uphold those principles that you've just talked about of the natural justice uh, throughout the investigation process. Yeah, um, I mean, for, in this field of work reputation is everything <laughs> right true that and and i have seen uh lawsuits i have seen grievances i've seen arbitrations where someone engaged in this line of work um has placed themselves at risk because they did not conduct themselves in an unbiased impartial fair thorough process um and so for us um this is something that um that I am very, very uh, passionate about is that um, we do investigations and oftentimes in an investigation, there are influences. We have our clients that are influencing because they want a certain finding. We have lawyers that are influencing because they want a certain finding. We have a lot of external influences sometimes that will, um, we have to basically protect the integrity of the investigation because it's our name that's on the report um, it's our reputation that's at risk. So with that, I would suggest that anyone that has concerns about the bias is that they do their due process and find out who's doing the investigation, what's their reputation, um, what is their, uh, not only reputation, but what is their track record? Um, we're doing 200, over 200, 250 investigations a year in many different industries and not once have we had um, have we had a lawsuit. Not once have we lost a, uh, anything with respect to uh, a legal uh, challenge of our uh, investigations. Getting to the investigation process. Um, and for those who are listening, I'm probably going to be mentioning a few things over the next few minutes that are very sensitive in nature. I'm not going to go into specifics, but when you're dealing with sexual harassment and discrimination, there is some sense that there is some uh, mental issues, mental health uh, uh, capabilities that you have to worry about. So I just want to make sure that if you're uh, prone to uh, some post-traumatic stress, please just cautiously listen to this episode or watch this episode. When should a municipality call in an organization like yours? Because municipalities want to seem like they're protecting all staff members, whether it be CAO, whether it be council, whether it be administration, whether it even be residents. But you never want to be the first to raise your hand and say, we have a problem with sexual misconduct. We have a problem with discrimination in our, our organization. When does a municipality have to make that call and say, okay, now it's time to call Veritas Solutions to come in and work with us to figure out what's going on with our organization? Yeah, I think, you know, the issue of sexual harassment, and of course, as you know, I mean, I watch the headlines on this particular topic, uh, same way that you are, you know, <laughs> in, embedded in everything municipality. Uh, I'm embedded in everything investigations, harassment, sexual harassment. So I'm, uh, we scan the headlines all the time. I'm very, very interested. And you will find there's not a week goes by in Canada that there's not a headline related to harassment or sexual harassment. It It, it is, it is really, really, um, I, I think that it's disturbing 
number one, um, that these things are still going on in the workplace. Um, but I think there's a whole bunch of factors that come to play as to why um, we are reading more and more of these stories. And what I, I, I mean, our, our philosophy is very simple. So if I take off my investigator hat and I put on my consultant hat, uh, which we do. Um, so we do consult uh, in areas of risk management. And I uh, am with a client and a client says, we have these concerns coming forward, um, but we don't think there's anything to it. And, you know, maybe it's sour grapes and maybe it's a disgruntled former employee and maybe it was a performance management and all these maybe, maybe, maybes. Um, I will be very direct and say, you've got an allegation of sexual harassment. It's going to be your number one risk. It's, it's, a, it's a highly risky area because it is, um, A, uh, offensive to uh, most persons of goodwill that this is going on, um, and B, it is traumatic. Uh, if someone has experienced sexual harassment in the workplace, sexual assault, cover-up, um, gender discrimination, whatever, whatever kind of um, bucket that might be, um, it is very traumatic. And there's going to be um, implications of that trauma. So um, I... I sad to say that I think sometimes decision makers either A, have put their head in the sand and don't want to acknowledge this going on, B, maybe the persons that are involved in, in these types of uh, situations, the respondent of the allegation, maybe they're high performers, maybe they're well-liked, maybe they're popular. Um, I'll give you the example of Gian Gomeshi with CBC. Um, when they did a review of Gian Gomeshi's uh, tenure at his time in CBC, um, there was this whole um, story of abuse, abuse of power, covering up, um, letting him be uh, who he is because he's the rainmaker. He's the big money maker for CBC at the time. And so the, the report that was done by Ruben Tomlinson of Toronto was very, very critical of how the organization dealt with him. And we see that often with high performers, the rainmaker, um, the, the golden child, whatever you want to call that person that has now been enabled, empowered, and allowed to abuse others because they weigh the risks. It's playing out in the headlines. Um, the Me Too movement certainly sh shone light on it. Um, it's, it's in all industries, including municipalities. Is it hard to do an investigation when... I find this conversation fascinating so far, and we're only about 10, 15 minutes into it. Is it hard to do an investigation when the 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 purpose of the investigation is to investigate someone like a mayor, a counselor, or a CAO? Because the ramifications of that type of investigation could be potentially job constraining on people who file those complaints. In your process, through an investigation, whether it be council, CAO, and I'm just picking on those because those are typically the staples of every municipality. Every other municipality has different uh, directors, but those are the staples. When you're dealing with an investigation that is from the top up, top down, I should say, is it hard to get people to open up and be honest and not fear for any potential ramifications that may come if they do speak out. Absolutely. I mean, we had one case where this woman was absolutely traumatized. She spent the first 10 minutes with me um, absolutely sobbing, fearful that by speaking to me and telling me what's been going on, that she would lose her job. And so what I say to our clients is that that is a very strong indicator of the type of culture you have. If people are fearful of speaking the truth because there's going to be retaliation, that infers that either there's been a history of retaliation that they're fearful of, or that leaders are behaving in certain ways that would have uh, an indication that there is likely to be retaliation. So it tells you a lot about the culture. A culture of fear is not going to appreciate the light being shone on behaviors that are, um, you know, whether it be bullying, harassment, sexual harassment, or discrimination. Um, if there's a culture of fear, you, it's very challenging to have people come forward. But I'm seeing more and more people making those choices to come forward without fear or favor because it's the right thing to do. 
what's the biggest obstacle that you over you have to overcome when you first start an investigation? So the municipality, the organization has called Veritas Solutions, said, we, we want to hire your organization, come in. What is the biggest obstacle that you have to overcome yourself as an organization before you even can start that investigation? Because the the the, the saying goes, the, the hardest step of any journey is the first step. And for you, that first step is going into that organization. I think, you know, what, I mean, we talk about procedure. I mean, we're all, we're going to have lots of challenges in our interviews and people are fearful and people are not sharing completely and stuff like that. But I think from a procedural perspective, one of our, our biggest obstacles that we have to overcome at the get-go is our independence. Um, we will sometimes have um, organizations, municipalities, or the lawyers representing the municipalities want to guide our process, want to guide our investigation. And we have to set very strong boundaries to say, no, you've hired us to be an independent, impartial, unbiased, third-party investigator. That means we guide the process. We will follow their their policies. We will make sure that we're we're adhering to their policies, which are usually well well written, frankly. Um, and and yet we will maintain our independence. And that's where if we have one of our associate investigators working and there seems to be some meddling going on or someone's trying to guide it or that type of thing, I'll usually get involved. Set a very strong boundary to say this is why you hired us. And if you're not willing to respect that boundary, you've hired the wrong firm, because that is our reputation to be impartial fair, unbiased. You bring up a good point, and I was going to ask this later on, but I want to talk about it now. Uh, when you go into organizations, I'm assuming you look at the policies and procedures of every municipality or every organization, and you see what they define as discrimination, harassment, so on and so forth. Have you ever gone into an organization and say, unfortunately, what you're asking us to investigate you have said is not an investigatable offense. So how do you work through a process where the the reason you're there doesn't match up with what their uh, policies outline? Yeah, I mean, well, there's there's I mean, there's two aspects, right? We have policy, which we're, we're, we're basically an investigation. You're testing against something. Yeah. Right. You're testing behavior against something. So if you're testing behavior against um, uh, mayor and council code of conduct, or you're testing behavior against policy, or you're testing behavior against legislation. So will you so, look at the legislation prior to the investigation or after the investigation to see if it matches up? Well, so it's actually, so it's, it's reverse <laughs> what you just said. The legislation exists. It's yeah. whether or not their policy code of conduct adheres to the legislation. Okay. Right. So, so the legislation is there. We know the legislation with respect to discrimination under human rights, harassment under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, so we know the legislation. We'll test their, we'll look at their policy to see if it adheres to legislation. I'll give you one example. One of the municipalities we worked for um, identified the human rights protected grounds that someone was not allowed to um, breach in whatever, you know, whether they're speaking about it or posting social media or whatever. And there was one human rights protected ground that was missing in the policy. And that was gender identity. Now we know that that's a hot button issue, particularly in Alberta. And the absence of gender identity as being a protected ground, even though it's enshrined in, in human rights legislation, the absence in the code of conduct was um, what <laughs> we have to wonder why, right? Because usually your codes of conduct, your your policies, et cetera, usually they're written by either lawyers or they're reviewed by lawyers or they're written by someone that should know that stuff. So why was that particular protected ground under the human rights right across Canada missing from the code of conduct? That is not a question that I could answer no matter what. <laughs> I couldn't answer it either. <laughs> but we did. So as a consultant, we did raise that as um, a concern that your your codes of conduct and policy do not align with legislation. Are these investigations happening in person or are they being ha are they happening remotely? So when 
a Veritas solution gets hired by an organization, are you basically going up and setting up camp in the organization for a week long period to conduct those investigations? Or is it a, I'm going to come in on Friday and then next week I'm going to come in on Thursday because I don't want people to pretend that things are okay when I'm there for a week. I want to sort of get the natural feel of what the organization actually feels like when people just randomly drop in. Um, Pre-pandemic, um, we would sometimes do what you described. Come into a municipality, stay in a hotel, find an office, um, coordinate your interviews. People come. We prefer to have them what I call off campus or outside of their office, right? Because these are sensitive. Um, so pre-pandemic, that's how we would conduct them. Post-pandemic, um, every one of our investigators would agree, and people that work in this in this industry right across Canada would agree, we much prefer virtual. And there is a number of factors that um, that contribute to that. First and foremost, being trauma-informed, so these are sensitive issues, right? A, a person on person allegation of misconduct is painful, whether it be harassment, bullying, sexual harassment. It's painful for someone who's experiencing that type of behavior. Um, there can be some trauma there. Um, there's lots of studies that support that workplace bullying um, is very traumatic and has a, a significant impact on mental health. Um, sexual harassment, sexual assault, of course, um, we know just intuitively that's going to have a negative impact on mental health. And so being trauma informed, we would rather have people in their safe place, which is at their home. Most everyone has learned how to work with Zoom or work with one of the platforms to be able to. And so that's one of the factors that contributes to it. The second factor is that we don't and, and anyone that either takes uh, courses or um, or, you know, kind of um, tries to sell um, how to read body language um, is debunked. It's snake oil. It's a pseudoscience. Um, we don't believe in body language or reading body language. We will pick up on people's um, affect. We will pick up on people's, um, you know, the way they're feeling and we can observe, but we're not reading body language to determine if someone's being truthful. And so there's a whole number of different things that we strongly believe that a virtual investigation and the pros of a virtual investigation far exceed the cons, including costs. Um, so we're an external firm. Um, we bill by the hour. And if we have to travel here, travel there, I mean, it may double the cost if we're going in somewhere, maybe a small community up north or something like that, versus being able to uh, conduct it virtually, which we um, we have shown and learned that can be done uh, to a very high standard from a virtual perspective. Since the pandemic, we've moved to a more virtual remote work environment. Now... <sighs> I'm a, I'm a big proponent of saying social media has been one of the downfalls of our society. That's just me saying that right here, right now. But we are seeing more and more uses of digital communication platforms within organizations, texting each other, going back and forth with people, emails, all that fun stuff, Zoom, Teams, you name it. How do you navigate the complex complexities of that investigation when the workplace is in a virtual environment because body language is one thing, but I can misconstrue a text message that someone sent me that might seem sincere to somebody else. But to me, I might say that's discriminatory what you just said, but other mm. someone else could say that just because you took it that way doesn't mean that it actually happened. When you're doing conversations like this, one-on-one -on -one, in person, it gives an air of, I understand what you're saying. I can hear the inflection in your voice. I can hear the tone in what you're saying. But when you're doing it in a virtual setting, it can get lost in translation. How do you work in that virtual environment in 2024? Um, you know, like the, I'll be honest, when we're talking about evidence, right? So because we're evidence-based, um, you but and doesn't, I- But doesn't evidence have to come from somewhere though? Yeah. And so if you and I were having a conversation and we have a heated conversation yeah. um, and we just don't like each other. And I like you, Bob. I like, yeah, I, like you, Bob. I do, too. I can tell that we would enjoy uh, having a beer or something, Chris. <laughs> um, but let's say hypothetically that were to happen and we're having these conversations and it's your word against my word. There's no other evidence to support anything. 
if we're having similar conversations within text message or teams or or instant messaging or whatever it is um there's actually a record of our conversation that record from an evidentiary perspective is helpful to an investigator now the the issue of reading into tone and those types of things um we don't necessarily read into tone but we place a lens of reasonableness on it right is it reasonable to read that this was uh, insulting, degrading, humiliating, or whatever, right? And so, it, and and people, for whatever reason, you've seen it on social media, obviously, um, but people think that it's okay to, you know, all caps yell with about 15 uh, exclamation marks to get your point across that you're angry. Well, we will read that in a text message and say, the reasonable person would um, interpret the tone of being aggression and anger. Right. Um, flip side, if I send a curt message or a one word response to your email and said, yep, got it or whatever, and it's just curt. Well, we would not interpret that as okay. uh, being aggressive. We would just say it's just curt because that's how we've learned how to communicate. Right. With brevity, with um, with the ability to just quickly say, yep, got it, or whatever it is. Right. So. Um, you know, so I think it's just, it's the reasonable person lens, Chris, that we put it on. The other mm -hmm. part of that is how people are interpreting tone, interpreting words, interpreting looks, interpreting behavior, we have to examine through our lens of credibility. And that's a whole other conversation about how to assess credibility. How do you do that? So let's <laughs> do that. Let's have that conversation right now, because you can get, I can imagine, in your time investigating complaints of harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination, there has been times where it's a he said, he said, he said, she said, she said, she said, they said, they said. And you, at the end of the day, have to... And I'm not playing, not saying that you're playing judge, uh, judge and jury, but you kind of are because yeah. at the end of the day, you have to come up with a uh, finding that is going to be beneficial for the organization, but for the people involved in the investigation. How do you adhere to, uh, how do you make sure that what you're getting is credible information and not just hearsay? Yeah. So I'm just going to challenge one word you use there, beneficial. Go for it. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Some of our findings are not beneficial. I think, <laughs> in the big, I think in the big picture, they are. Well, that's what I meant. I apologize. Right? Yes, For you sure. are right. Um, they may not be perceived as beneficial, particularly when there's a lawsuit that follows our investigation because our investigation showed that the organization um, mishandled, poorly handled, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so we conduct credibility assessments. We have a 12-point factor. We're one of the only firms out there that does it. And with that, because we're we're often dealing with the they said, they said scenarios, no other evidence. And we still believe you come to a finding based on credibility assessments. Who is credible? There's two aspects to credibility assessment. It's not just about honesty. The other aspect or component of credibility is about reliability. Are they reliable in their interpretation? And the courts have identified what they call a complex admixture of factors for us to determine reliability. That could be cognitive, it could be mental health, it could be psychological, it could be developmental, it could be time, it could be memory. Um, and so just because th there's this concept in law that says a person can be truthful, but mistaken. And that goes to that point of reliability of your perceptions and your experiences. So we will, we will weigh those out. We conduct credibility assessments on every one of our cases. We find out who is more credible. Two aspects, honesty and reliability. Okay, uh, the sensitive question time if following that credible. Given the sensitive nature of harassment and discrimination complaints, and particularly around sexual harassment complaints, how do you approach trauma-informed interviewing? Hmm. Because yeah. when, when a traumatic event happens, you may not remember exactly what transpired leading up to that traumatic event, but you know that traumatic event inside and out. Yeah. So when you're looking at that credible, reliable investigation practice that you need to ensure that they are a credible source, how do you... 
What techniques do you put into place as Veritas Solutions and the people that work for you to support the individuals who are going to have to relive what they've gone through over yeah. and over again when they're doing those, those that conversation with you? Yeah. Chris, um, I've been teaching um, uh, this type of stuff for a bunch of thousands over uh, the past, you know, six years. And I have one particular module in my, just trained yesterday, um, HR professionals across Alberta, uh, virtually. And um, in one of my modules, um, I have trauma-informed investigative interviewing. Um, our team has been trained in trauma-informed. Um, I present a module on trauma-informed. That's not necessarily going to make someone an expert in being trauma informed, but at least it brings awareness to what's required for trauma informed interviewing. And there's an it, it's a real um, tension and and having to strike that right balance that we're there to find the truth, and that means we have to test evidence, and we have to test credibility, and we have to um, address inconsistencies. And yet we have to do that in a trauma-informed way that there, we're not re-traumatizing the person that we're interviewing, right? Is that hard? Is that a hard line to walk in 2024 when it's trauma? An yeah. It's an art, and I'll and 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 maybe I'll I'll, I'll um, maybe I'll role play with you just a moment to show you how that might look. Okay. Okay. So if we are uh, doing uh, an interview and you are expressing some things that come from a place of trauma, um, you've been abused, you have been harmed, abused, bullied, sexually harassed, whatever it was. And I can see it's very painful relieving that. I am going to be picking up on that cues. I am going to soften my voice. I am going to slow down my voice. I am going to be safe. I am going to be calming. So I'll give you an example if there's an inconsistency. And I've seen investigators do this. They don't work for us. I could tell you that. But I've seen investigators do this, and they have been criticized in in, uh, in legal decisions. Uh, well, come on, Chris. I mean, before you told me this, and now you're telling me that. It doesn't make any sense. What am I supposed to do with that? Now, that is going to be harmful to someone that's experienced trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Flip side, um, Chris... I, I just heard you, you know, kind of relay this, and I can see that's a bit challenging. Um, but there is an inconsistency that I really need to be able to probe, and it might be a little bit uncomfortable. But I want to really want to understand. Uh, in your written complaint, you had uh, mentioned um, that this occurred, but now I just heard you say that this occurred, and it is inconsistent. I want to just understand that. Are you able to explain that for me? People are flawed, though. You and I both know that people, people can major events in my life. I can remember, like, I can remember what side of the road I drove off the very first time I drove off a road <laughs> in a car because I hit black ice. I went to this left yeah. side of the ditch and my husband continuously tells me that every time you go out, please aim for the right side, not the left side, because that way you'll be a little bit safer. Anyway, that being said, people are flawed. People yeah. are inherently flawed that they can remember things when they're writing it down, but yeah. three, four months, five months after an investigation has started, they're not going to remember every specific detail. When you talk about that inconsistency, is it hard to try to dissect what is actually inconsistent and what is actually false? Yeah. Um, so, so the, here's the, the, and, and you bring up two points, right? So this is the two factors of credibility is honesty and reliability. And so that's what yeah. you're talking about. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's being dishonest, right? And in our trauma informed training, we do exactly what you talk about is that understanding that what is sometimes critical to our interviewee, what they remember may not make any sense to an investigator because that's not what the investigator is looking at. They want to know about this and the interviewee is telling you something over here because that's what they remember or that's what comes up in their memory. And because because uh, trauma impacts memory, but it also um, there's this reliving of trauma that um, it is probably one of the most challenging things that we have to do is to be able to discern whether or not the problematic memory makes a person unreliable but if we understand it through a trauma lens we can say that's an indicator of trauma 
And we're not going to reject that testimony because of the indicator of trauma. And Would so you... Go ahead. we have to we have to really strike that balance. And and I, I truly believe we do it well um, because we're aware of it and we understand it. And we're not going to negatively uh, assess someone as not being credible because they had a problem remembering something or they didn't remember the specific details, but did remember something that was peripheral. What happens when someone recants their statement? During the middle of an investigation, if they say, I, I can't do this, Bob, I'm sorry, I don't want to continue reliving what I've gone through, and I just want to walk away. I, while it probably has not doesn't happen all the time, it probably has come up where a witness or someone who has lodged a complaint has recanted and said, it's, I, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. What happens in that situation with an investigation? Does it just cease to exist, or do you continue to still go through the process to potentially stop this from happening again well so the investigation's um role and goal is to try to figure out what happened right to try to find the truth as best as we can on what's but, called the but if, but if someone recants their statement on the the reason why the investigation is going it's not like the investigation can continue on without that key credible person who has lodged the complaint Right. So let me, yeah. So there's a difference. Recanting means um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm reversing, right. Just yeah. that, versus saying, look, you know what? I did put in the complaint, okay. um, but I, but I don't want it to go forward. I don't want to get involved in it going forward. That's going to be usually a decision of our clients. We might consult with them right now. Here's the thing. Let's say Chris, you were the recipient of an allegation of misconduct and sexual misconduct. And the uh, there's a there's a written complaint out there about your behavior, and then the complainant um, resigns from the organization, and the complainant says, "I'm not cooperating." Well, we still you still have this um, complaint against you alleging this misconduct. For me, the the area of fairness is to give you the opportunity to respond to it to know about it and respond to it, regardless of whether someone wants to proceed. So what we'll usually work with our clients is to say, look, let the respondent know that this person has left the employment, they're not wanting to go forward, but also let them know that we would like to give them an opportunity to respond. If they don't take the opportunity to respond, that's their choice, right? But it's about fairness, because if I if I had a false allegation made against me, and then someone leaves, I want to be able to respond to it. Right? How do you stop the blurring of lines? Because any organization, whether it be municipal, whether it be the private sector, the people you work with are traditionally the people you hang out with after work hours and go out to the bar, go play board games like I used to do when I worked in a municipality with my friends who were my coworkers. And sometimes, and I'm not saying this happened with me, but sometimes things can happen outside of work, but can affect the work balance relationship. When an investigation does happen, how important is it for you as the investigator and the team that's investigating a complaint to forego anything that has happened outside the four walls of the office and only focus on the things that are happening in the office? Because the, the, the saying in my old organization was, what happens at home stays at home. What happens in the office stays at the office, and they have to be separate. And I truly believe that is the case. But there can be that blurring of lines where I'm saying, I can't work with Jim anymore because Sandra had a, a nasty experience at the bar with them when they were out at the bar last Friday. Is it hard to sort of separate the two when you're investigating an issue that has only happened at the bank or at the, the not the bank, <laughs> at the organization? So, um, the law identifies factors where the organization um, can take action. And the factor is this, is that if there is a nexus to the employment or an impact on the workplace. And so I'll give you an example. We had one case where a young woman, uh, older director, young woman, uh, they're in the bar, 
um, they were celebrating a, a success in the office. They're in the bar and she has her buttock scrubbed. She turns around and the director's standing there. There's alcohol involved. The director's standing there and he's got a bit of a grin on his face and she challenges him right then and there. Did you do that? And he kind of laughs and gives a, a half response. That happened off duty. That woman has to go to work with that guy tomorrow morning. That's going to have a significant impact on the workplace. And so we investigate, even though it's off duty, there's the, and we investigate that there's a clear nexus to the employment. We come to a finding in that case, we came to a finding, yes, it did happen. And then the organization took the appropriate action. So and social media, off duty. I can say what I want in social media. No, you can't. <laughs> right? Um, so, so any nexus to the employment or nexus to the employer, the employer has the jurisdiction to investigate and correct the behavior. Okay. I have to stop you there because I have to ask this question because you brought up something that I see all the time on social media. <clears throat> People on social media put, put in their bios, the views and uh, the, the views expressed on this social media platform do not represent my employer or my uh, my business. Is that a legal loophole? Can people actually put that and not be fired for posting derogatory sexual harassment things on their social media platform and the business say, well, you said it was your own view, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And, and what you're talking about jurisdiction, it was a recent case and a little bit different, but there's a recent case out of Ontario. And it was a dentist that posted misogynistic um, sexual innuendo on his TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it was. And someone complained to the college, the College of Dentists. And <clears throat> you're seeing this play out in the Jordan Peterson case. You're seeing it play out in regulatory. We do a lot of regulatory work as well. And um, increasingly, the regulatory bodies are identifying that the fact that you are a dentist and everyone knows you're a dentist and what you're seeing is um, uh, sexually um, inappropriate or misogynistic or whatever, you have a code of conduct as a professional, as a dentist, and we will discipline or sanction you. The workplace, the employer, the municipality, um, the courts are increasingly supporting the fact that someone's off-duty behavior, if it has a negative impact on the employer and the reputation of the employer, pardon me, <coughs> <coughs> there's a number of factors that the courts have outlined um, that they have the jurisdiction to sanction that behavior. Thank you so much for that. Greatly appreciate it. I, you said it. I needed to ask that question. Uh, I'm cautious of time, and I have a few follow-up questions that I need to ask before we let you go here, Bob. And I want to talk about the balance. The balance of the, how do you balance the need for confidentiality and transparency when communicating with a municipality, with a business, through the investigation process? Because what Sandra says to you is probably going to be public when that investigation report goes to a council or goes to a business. But maybe some things that she has said doesn't all go into that report, but the crux of it would. Is it important for you to balance that need for confidentiality? And when someone says, can I tell you this off the record or can I talk to you off the record about what I saw and transparency when it comes to that initial finding? Yeah, and you identify a really critical piece, Chris, is that remember I talked about the principles of natural justice procedural fairness. So Jim has the right to know what was said about him. Yeah. Right? He By who, right though? Yes. From a legal perspective, yes. What we try our very best to do, and we identify that there's a requirement for confidentiality, um, but we cannot guarantee confidentiality because sometimes we have one of our cases where the judge ordered all of our reports um, disclosed to a lawyer in a class action lawsuit. It's up on the website. You could read them today. Um, and everyone's names is in there. I was shocked that they were not redacted, but the judge did not order them redacted. So we as the investigator can never guarantee confidentiality and can never guarantee anonymity. We can do our very best to try, try to keep the process and the investigation confidential to the degree that law will allow. Okay. So... 
uh, as someone who's worked in municipalities and who has spoken to municipal leaders from across the country, I hear time and time again, we get the report, it goes to sit on the shelf and nothing ever happens with it. How do you ensure that the findings and the recommendations of your investigations <clears throat> are effectively implemented by municipal authorities or um, uh, 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 businesses or whoever you're hired to do an investigation for to prevent future incidents, instances of misconduct, whether it be discrimination, sexual harassment or harassment? So um, we have to differentiate between um, what the requirement of an investigation is and what the purpose is versus a review. OK, so there are a lot of consultants that do reviews. But and your do investigation a... leads to that review. So how do you ensure that your investigation leads to that review? We can't. Um, so as a third party investigator, um, our investigators do not give recommendations. OK, we may we provide to our client um, that they may consult with me or they may consult with some of our senior uh, folks um, for recommendations and how to prevent but that's not the investigator's role. The investigator comes to a finding, uh, provides aggravating, mitigating factors. Now it's up to the organization to take the corrective action required. Then they may come to us and say, how do we prevent this in the future? And that's when we will go in, we'll do culture assessments, we'll do reviews, we'll do um, uh, psychological safety assessments um, and, and work with them to implement a, uh, a package of uh, responses appropriate to that particular area. So if a culture has allowed for, as an example, sexual talk in the workplace nonstop, because the manager talks about sex all the time, so everyone believes that's normalized, um, we will come in and say, look, we've had, we this is an area of risk for you because you have a manager that's talking about their sex life all the time. You have young people coming in and they think that's normalized. We come in and talk about sex until someone says, no, stop. That's harassment. And now all of a sudden you have a whole culture that has enabled and has normalized sexual conversation, sexual innuendo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and someone says, no, that's sexual harassment, and it is. So we'll work with the client if they choose to allow us to work with them to shift culture. So before I wrap up, I have one final question, and it's about the future of investigations here. How has the nature of the workplace investigations evolved over the last few years? And what trends are you looking at? And do you foresee impacting investigations in the municipal sector moving forward into 2025, 2026, 2027? Um, the evolution is this, is that historically, <clears throat> if it was CAO down, historically, it'd be the local HR folks that do the investigations. And there's all kinds of risks attached to that if they haven't been trained. Um, if there's a reasonable apprehension of bias, if there's conflicts of interest, if they know all of the players and now they have to investigate. That's that's one of the um, the evolution where we're starting to see that they see that that's an area of risk and that area of risk would cause them to go external. Um, that's the one thing. Um, I get to interact with HR professionals from across Western Canada in my courses, and I've asked every one of my, my courses, are you seeing an increase in complaints of harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination, and probably 95% are seeing an increase in the complaints. That's, that's the trend. So we can anticipate this trend, we can anticipate that it will continue up until such point as that behavior is not normalized in the workplace. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of culture shift to do. Um, just this week in the news, there was two major cases in the news that hit the Globe and Mail, national news. One of them, uh, an organization here in Alberta, um, and the other one was a, uh, a sport team. And the more the spotlight is on that, the more people are feeling empowered to come forward and say, me too. Is it that good? Well. Is that good, do you think? Um. I mean, more, no, I should say that. Are you? Is it good that more people are coming forward? Yes. Is it good that more people are coming forward because that the more prominence in the in the media realm? Um, yes, I would assume that. But do you believe it's good that 
people are finally willing to have this open, honest dialogue conversation about harassment, discrimination, sexual harassment in the workplace that it was not probably acceptable in the early 2000s, even probably in the 1990s, it wasn't that prominent. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's the evolution of human rights. It's the ev evolution of dignity and respect. And everyone should be able to come to work and experience respect and dignity, regardless of uh, gender, regardless of orientation, regardless of age. Um, we all want to come to work and not be harmed. And um, if we're harmed by someone's words or actions, um, then there is a responsibility, a duty of care on the employer to ensure people are not psychologically harmed. WCB uh, reported an increase, 35% increase in 2019 from 2018 of uh, accepted lost time injury due to psychological injury. 35% increase because now there's legislation to say you can't do that. You can't yell, scream, swear. You can't belittle. You can't um, you know, cause someone to um, experience uh, fear at work and humiliation at work. Um, and if you got away with that years and years ago, you're now going to become... Um, an outlier because organizations are evolving. And so we are a risk management, we're a HR risk management firm. And I use that term because that's what has to grab the attention of the leaders. I'm not going to moralize about whether it's right or wrong for you to bully somebody or to discriminate against somebody. That's not my role. That's someone else's role. If they want to moralize about it, I'm going to let you know your risks. So if you keep allowing your employees to speak in this way or speak derogatorily about someone that happens to identify from an LGBTQT perspective or 2S perspective, and you allow your employees to uh, speak that way, you're placing yourself at risk. Bob, I want to thank you. Um, this has been, uh, I feel like we've just scratched the surface and we may need to bring you back on for round two of this conversation. Sure. Yeah. But... For more information about Veritas Solutions, to reach out, to get in contact with Bob, to because he always has, he's always hosting webinars throughout. Uh, I'm assuming that they're webinars, so anyone in Canada can apply to uh, take that training courses. But for those who are looking to bring Bob's organization, Veritas Solutions, in, the links are in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, scroll down and click on the links. If you're listening to this via audio and you're listening to a car, please pull over before doing that. But <laughs> afterwards, you get home, check out the links in the show notes. Bob, it's been an honor and a pleasure to sit down with you. Um, to talk about this important subject that is becoming more and more prominent in the news and the need for it is more and more pressing than ever before. So thank you so much. You as well. I really appreciate the time with you, Chris. Uh, you are a really engaging uh, interviewer, so you make it easy. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of the decisions of local governments in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of the growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross-Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.